Thank you guys so much for blessing us this morning. Uh, I want to echo what Steve was talking about earlier uh, with our new emphasis in the coming year of reading through Scripture together. So please take a moment uh, out in all three of our lobbies. We've got those cards that will let us know that you're doing this along with the group and also the preferred email address so we can send you updates and also send you the passage for the day um, as a constant reminder. So hopefully every morning when you get to the office or before you leave for the day to go to school, you can read through your three to four chapters and stay up and, and current with everyone. Also, next to the daily reading sheets that we have out there and the commitment cards for that. We also have a big, wide place for you to sign up to help out with our 8 o'clock service. We mentioned this last week. We'd really appreciate it if every man, woman, child could sign up for one month, is all we're asking, uh, to be a blessing in that uh, earlier service, and that would really help us out in this service as well. So please take a moment uh, figure out which month you'd like to do and, and take your friends and family and go sign up for one of those months and that would really be a blessing to us. Um, if you're just reading through the headlines this week, I don't know how many of you on your homepage read through some of the stuff that's going on or you catch the news at 5 o'clock. Is it just me or does it appear that evil is definitely at hand? That there's a lot of things going on. Just this week, more young men and boys came forward in the Jerry Sandusky case. And as one governor, former governor, was pleading his case before Congress, trying to decide uh, what he was going to tell them and, and how he could explain a billion and a half dollars he has no idea where it went to, another a former governor was being led away in chains to prison for his corruption a few years ago. The second shooting took place on the Virginia Tech campus. And oh, by the way, the city of New Orleans released their annual statistics on homicides. And in the, at the beginning of December, they realized that they had eclipsed 183 more than their total for last year. And there was still the, the majority of the month to go. So yes, evil is all around us. It is not just random. It appears to me that it's also being targeted towards those that profess the name of Jesus Christ. County officials in Virginia approved an atheist group to erect a holiday display on the grounds of the Loudoun County Courthouse. If you can't see it, it's a skeleton dressed up like Santa that's then being nailed to the cross. And this was placed right next to the annual nativity scene. And speaking of nativity scenes, former Baywatch star Pamela Anderson was cast for the role of the Virgin Mary in a spoof of the birth of Christ. And as I was seeing this, I was thinking, I didn't watch it, but I was thinking, what in the world is nothing sacred anymore? But I, it's not just ideology that's being coming under attack. Gordon Conwell Seminary released a story this week that over 170,000 Christians have been martyred for bearing the name of Christ this year. 170,000. It's just incredible. And of course, I know you guys were blessed a few months ago when we had Bob Fu come in and talk about the things that are happening in China and the persecution that Christians are going uh, through there. But you know, whether it's in our schools or it's in our neighborhoods or in our office place or in government, you, you see evil around you and you wonder, is there enough good people? Are there enough people that are bought into the message of Jesus Christ to keep the system from being overloaded? Is there enough good to counterbalance the evil that we see around us? Well, if you're overwhelmed by these thoughts, I want to extend a gift of hope to you this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In our study of, of Peter's lessons, we've talked about how the Christians in the first century were going through a vast persecution, that it was really being attacked not only from... Uh, the Gentiles that didn't believe in Jesus, but also from the Jews as well. We know this was the story of Paul and Stephen. And so you have this persecution that's going on, but there was also something that maybe sometimes we don't have as acute sense of what's happening. The, the first century Christians really understood a little better than I think we do the spiritual battles that were being waged. They understood that the persecution that they were going through was not just at the hands of pagan masters and pagan neighbors 
and pagan rulers, but really demonic forces that were behind them. If you remember how the Gospel writers tell the story of, of Judas, it said it was when Satan entered into his body that he went and made preparations to go against Jesus and to sacrifice him there. So if you think about these things in that day and in our day, when we see wickedness around us and we see persecution abounding plausibly, many of us ask the question, is the power of God great enough to counterbalance and keep at bay the power of Satan? Well, Peter has a message for us today. Let's read together in 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. What a fantastic verse. He was put to, get in, put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience before God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone in heaven and is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. It's a pretty powerful text Martin Luther wrote in his commentary. A wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for certainly just what Peter means. He's like, it sounds like a great idea, but I have no idea what Peter's saying here. I know it's a powerful text, but hey, you could read this a lot of different ways. And if Martin Luther struggled, you know I'm going to struggle. But I'm going to do the best I can to try to unpack what was happening here. At the end of the day, if you disagree with where I land, you're in good company because pretty much anything you can come up with a view on what this passage means, you'll find a commentary and a scholar that'll be right there with you. But I'm going to do the best I can. In verse 18, we see kind of a central teaching that's laid out in the, in the New Testament. It's the gospel message laid. The Holy One, God, sent His one and only Son, the righteous on behalf of the unrighteous. Why? To bring us to God. It's a gospel message. And unlike the annual Jewish uh, ceremonies and the different sacrifices, the events at Cal Calvary didn't have to be repeated. It's, it's done. It's one for all, for all of our sins. Pretty straightforward. But here's where things kind of get a little dicey. Uh, Peter tells us that through the power of the Spirit that Jesus goes to preach in prison to those from the time before the flood, and like Noah, you should get baptized. And you're like, okay, what exactly is he talking about here? Well, there's, two, there's many different views, I'm sure, but two predominant views on this passage are that number one, between the death and the resurrection, while his body laid in the tomb, Jesus' spirit was active. And Jesus goes in the form of a spirit and he descends to the temporary abode of the dead, where the souls of disobedient people from the, the time of the flood were in prison to make his proclamation. Okay, well, is there even a place like this mentioned in Scripture? Well, yeah, David mentions in Psalms 30 in verse 3, O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Well, Sheol is also mentioned by the prophet Isaiah. And then we see Hades being mentioned by Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 15. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? Shall you be brought down to Hades? And in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, we see Jesus kind of comparing himself and drawing an analogy between him and the reluctant prophet to Nineveh. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, I don't know. I guess that's what Peter's talking about here. Only thing is, Peter writes to the Christ preached to the spirits who disobeyed, not the spirits of the people. So he seems to be targeting here spiritual beings, not 
human beings. Well, there is another option, an option that I've landed on, is that Peter is referring to a visit that Jesus has made after his ascension, as he's traveling to the highest heaven, he stops by and he preaches to those in a heavenly prison during his ascension. Well, why does it have to be up in the heavens? Well, in 2 Corinthians, Paul lays out that the man of Christ goes to, to the third heaven. So there, there is these different layers of heaven. And I don't want us to get off in the weeds too heavy because I don't want us to miss the message of this passage. But many of the Jewish writers from the first century believed in this judgment day holding cell, not on the earth, but in the lowest level of the heavens. So who did Jesus preach to on this journey? Because if it wasn't the human contemporaries of Noah, who was his message directed to? Well, I think it's interesting for us to, to figure out who these mysterious spirits were in prison. In Genesis chapter 6, we're, we're starting to get introduced to the story of Noah. We're getting ready to, to launch into the story of the flood. And all this is about to take place. And then there's four verses that are kind of strange and almost seem like they're out of place. Where it talks about these fallen angels, these spirits uh, that come down and see beautiful women, these earthly women, and unite with them to have children. And these spirits were people that the Lord detested. And the apocryphal book of First Enoch describes these beings as spirits and discusses in some detail their imprisonment within the heavenly realm. You're like, did his quote from the apocrypha? I, I'm just saying, it's not a part of our canon, but in the first century, they would have been privy to this information. And this would have been something that they would have read and a lot of people would have had access to. So Peter was trying to write to those that knew these traditions in fact, in his second letter, in his second letter, Peter seems to be uh, referencing this whole idea. In 2 Peter 2, and verse 4 through 5, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them, down, sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on his ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. And he goes on to describe this. Jude seems to echo these sentiments in Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. It said, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with the everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So what exactly is going on here? I believe that there were these fallen angels that have united with these humans, and, and the Lord is detesting these spirits the lord has held them in judgment because not only have they influenced the humans that were around them we see that the whole generation of people have become an abomination to the lord and he says there's going to be a payment for this and so jesus proclaimed victory after his death as he's ascending to heaven to those that are trapped there in this spirit's world whether it's from above or below Peter is trying to tell us about Jesus. Now enthroned alongside God, he said, he's superior to all these things. You're worried about these persecutions that are going on. You're worried about the evil that's in the world. You're worried about those that don't know Christ and how Satan is using them. The Lord has conquered them through his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, brothers and sisters, we can stand confidently to stand up against hospitality hostility and bear a courageous witness because just as jesus was vindicated on that day each one of us will be vindicated as well well peter then kind of takes a, a turn and he's kind of laying out some of this and then he starts thinking about okay well i've got the story of noah and i've got the story of the people that i'm trying to talk to how do i marry these two together and so the mention of increased sinfulness of hum humanity before the coming of the flood leads Peter to reflect on the fact that Noah's family was saved through water. So Christians then and now pass through the whole waters of baptism, just as those in her ark passed through and were saved from the waters of the flood. So in verse 21, the Apostle Peter uses the word antitype here. It's translated in, in our passage here in the NIV as, as symbolizes to show the parallel of the events of that day 
with the events of this day. He's like, you guys have been told the story of Noah since you were this big. Let me tell you how that translates into how you're going to be saved in your life. It's important that we understand this because Noah and his family escaped from the, the drowning of the flood. There's so many people around us that are drowning in the flood of sin. Well, the statement that baptism now saves you reflects a high view of baptism. I'm going to go out on a limb that there are some churches on this street that uh, just as soon that that passage did not even be in here. And even within our fellowship, there are those that are actively trying to, if not dismiss, to relegate baptism as something that's not all that important. And I, I, I want to, us to realize why. Why, is that, why are well-meaning believers doing this? Well, if we include baptism in the salvation process, there's a feeling and a thought that we, di- we diminish what Jesus did for us. So we have the work of the cross being partnered with our work in the baptistry waters, is what they say. And if we say that this is a part of the salvation process, then we diminish what Jesus had to do. Folks, I can't tell you how wrong that is. I do not feel that it is a work It is what we do in response to what Jesus has already done on our behalf. If indeed, I see a lot of glossed over eyes. Folks, this is important. Please wake up. Please pay attention. This is crucial to who we are as a people. It defines us. Folks, we have to realize what baptism is. We have to realize why it's important because it's actively been challenged. It never steal God's thunder when we're obedient. Amen? If we're commanded to do this and we're commanded to go and baptize others, we need to see that when we're called to respond in this way, God is not threatened. God is not usurped. When we come before Him, and you, you think of Jesus going down into the Jordan River, when, when the heavens open up, he didn't say, well, I guess it's all about you, Jesus. He says, no, you're my son. You bring me glory by your obedience. Let me send down the Spirit. This is crucial that we understand what God is trying to do and trying to say here. See, all throughout history, God has provided vehicles. He sees a problem. He wants to deliver his people, but he provides vehicles, ways for us to accomplish his will. The people then, the people today, do not understand and sometimes not buy in to these vehicles. You think of the uh, Naaman being asked to go dip seven times into Jordan. He's like, I've I've got rivers over at home. I could no. It's what God's asked you to do. And when he came up out and he said the skin was like a, a the flesh of a young boy, did they say, Wow, Naaman's awesome. Look what he did. No, it's what God has done, and God was glorified that day. You think of the Israelites when the death angels is coming through and they went. What he asked them to do is to put the blood of the lamb above the doorpost on the thing. Let this be a reminder. Did it make sense? No, especially not to the lamb. But the Lord says, do this. And, 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 and sure enough, the death angel passed over. It's a vehicle the Lord provided. Even with Noah building the ark out in the middle of a field far away from the water when it hadn't even rained on the earth, Was it his carpentry skills that saved him? Absolutely not. It's the power of God, but his obedience and God's instruction to what he was telling him to do was credited to him as righteousness. But that does not take away from what God did to save his family. The waters of baptistry, we need to realize that they're not magical. Peter says, you know what? They're not designed to clean the outside but rather to reflect what's going on on the inside, an inner transformation. It's a pledge of good conscience. Our sins are washed away, and we began this new life in Christ we're experiencing. You know, when Jill and I fell in love, we decided to get married. It didn't take away from our love when we went through a ceremony. There are some that will say, that's not necessary. Can't you just have love? Absolutely, but I want to 
to come before and make a vow before the Lord and make a vow before my family and my friends, a vow of marriage and a covenant that we're making. It does not take away or diminish the love by us going through that ceremony and making that pledge. Peter makes it clear it's not of our doing that we're saved. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 says, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not of us. Okay? So what is baptism? Here's my best take. Baptism is a place where our pledge is connected with God's power. Our pledge connected with God's power. And if you separate the two, it does not have the effect that God wants it to do. It's a place where the gospel story comes alive. As we enter in, we participate in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's a testimony to our beliefs. And to those that come and witness it, we believe in the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what he says in verse 21 and 22, Peter makes three things clear that I want us to understand. Number one, just as Noah and his family escaped despite the disobedience of the evil around him in their day, so Christians will be saved and will not be overcome. See, when we go through the waters of baptism, not only is sin taken away, but we overcome the evil that's trying to attack us and to take away our salvation. Romans 8.28, nothing in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Secondly, we see that baptism is the normal means of Christian initiation. It is common. But salvation is not the result of merely submitting to outward baptism. I've, I've talked with folks that I ask them, why were you baptized? Well, I had to. I couldn't get married. Well, why were you baptized? Well, to get my parents off my back. There's nothing magical about these waters apart from the pledge of good conscience to tap into the power of the Lord. It's coming to Him saying, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to be perfect, but Lord, I want to submit myself. It's just like in the husband-wife relationship. I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm committing myself to You for a lifetime. It's for those who come to the Lord in a good conscience to be set free to live for Him. And finally, finally, The one source of spiritual victory is a crucified and risen Jesus. Peter concludes this section by saying this, don't be afraid. The Christ whom you accept as your Lord truly is the Lord over all the opposition you may face. As a result, we can stand confidently before the throne. I'm sure some of you this morning, as I was talking about persecution and stuff, you're like going, well, I mean, this isn't Africa. Uh, I'm not in China don't exactly go through a whole lot of persecution here. I mean, this is Hunsel's Bible Belt. What are you talking about? Folks, if, if we truly imitate Jesus and live like he chose to live, if we say the things he chose to say and do those things and live according to life laid out in the Scripture, I promise we're going to go through opposition. Teenagers, if you guys dress modestly at your school, there are some folks that are going to say why aren't you wearing this or why are you wearing that? If you choose to remain pure in your dating lives, you will have someone break up with you. I, I'll just tell you. Because there are people that do not live according to the standards, if we all honor God in our speech, it will stand out because cussing has become so prevalent in this society. If we choose not to do that, we will stand out. I hate that that's the way it is, but it's become so prevalent. If we do our best in everything we do with honesty and integrity around our house and our jobs will stand out. And a lot of times it will bring about the, the scorn of others if we're willing to do this. But we have to be persistent in this and imitate Jesus Christ. And when we do, I promise the persecution will come. But we need to realize that in the future, we're promised that we will be vindicated. And we know that that's the path to step forward when we agree to be baptized, when we agree to take on Jesus, when we agree to make Him the Lord of our lives. And we we know this in the future, but sometimes we're like, I get tired of seeing evil triumph over good. We know in the end how the story's going to be played out. I think sometimes God gives us glimpses. Now, I'm not saying this is one, but I love this story. Last weekend, a young man 
Anthony Miranda on the south side of Chicago, decided to rob an unidentified gentleman. And he, he walked up to his car, and the man was parked there and had his window down, and he asked for a light, and as the man reached for a lighter or something, he turned around, and Anthony Miranda had a gun to his face. And he demanded his cell phone, he demanded his wallet, demanded some cash he had in the console and his jewelry. And the man agreed to give all these things gladly. He turned it over to him. Apparently for Anthony Miranda, it wasn't enough. And he asked the man to get out of the car, apparently trying to carjack him. Well, as the man exited from the car, it became apparent uh, that this was no ordinary guy. He was over six foot, 250 pounds, and very muscular. What he didn't know is his victim was a retired Special Forces soldier that was trained in hand-to-hand close combat and hostage retrieval specialist. He also didn't realize that since his time um, of being out of the armed services, he's he's dedicated himself to mixed martial arts and has competed around the country. He also didn't realize that the gentleman that he was carjacking had just won the ultimate fighting competition. He was a champion. Uh, Let's just say it didn't go well for Anthony Miranda. Let's see if we can get a picture of him. Before police could take this mugshot, they had to take him by the local hospital to (laughs) retrieve a a bullet out of his ankle from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The guy took it and it went off. Uh, And then they had to repair multiple lacerations. Now, I'm saying as Christians, it's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to turn the other cheek. But we need to realize that sometimes when we feel overwhelmed, we've got the Lord on our side. We know how the story plays out. We know the victory that's been won for us. Christ made the proclamation to the evil powers that said, we are going to win. And Satan says, I mean, Jesus came and said, no, look what I've done. And he announced the victory on the cross and confirmed their defeat. And now Peter says they're subject to him. They're at his footstool. Those who are persecuted need not be afraid of the evil around us. We need to realize that Jesus Christ has won the victory and stand firm. This morning, if you have not gave that pledge of good conscience, if you have not tapped into the story of Jesus and allowed him to rule your life, well, we would love to move these poinsettias and begin a new life with you in Christ today. Whatever your needs are this morning, we ask you to come as we stand and sing.